<laughs> so, welcome. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about OrbSoc, uh, the next generation. <coughs> A bit about myself. Uh, I'm working for OrbSoc in Gifbori, not Stockholm. I've uh, been working there for a few years and uh, basically a PGA designer, working on some system architecture, uh, maintaining some of the projects on open course. I've done some other software related projects over the years. Uh, and OrbSoc is mostly being developed on my spare time right now. So, for most of you, I think you know OrbSoc quite well. Um, this picture was shamelessly stolen from M. Cosm site. Uh, it was stolen from somewhere else. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's open source, you know. Yeah, exactly. It, it's true, it's got a CC license. <coughs> uh, but a bit of history. Uh, OrbSoc version 1 was started to have uh, something to use for simulating uh, and building the OR1200. Uh, then came OrbSoc version 2, uh, which expanded this by providing more board ports using regression tests and other good things like that. Uh, Orthog version 3 is still not defined. It could be cloud-based. No, just kidding. <laughs> so what do we use Orthog for? We use it to bring up systems. Uh, we use it to uh, uh, debug systems. We use it for regression tests of the processor itself. We use it to port to new target boards and we use it to run user programs. That's the five most common use cases that we have seen. But there are some issues. We have, in the Orbsoc tool, we have local copies of the cores that are available from open cores and from other places, which is a big problem that the, the fixes are not fed back to the upstream uh, repositories and they're beginning to be a bit out of date. Um, we have severe code duplication between the boards. We have, for example, arbiters that should be a more generic component, but is uh, yeah basically copied across all the ports. So it, it's a bit hard to maintain. We have some overlap with new lib. Uh, we have some basic drivers in Orbsoc that maybe should be somewhere else, and we have uh, an own definition of the SPR defs and things like that. It's a bit complicated to get started with. You have to go up and down the directory trees a lot to move from simulation to synthesis to backend place and routes and things like that. So it's a bit hard for newcomers. We do have excellent documentation now on this, uh, on the other hand. Uh, it's hidden in the OpenRisk tree, and that tree is very, very big. I'm talking about the subversion tree. Uh, so maybe it sh should not be there. And it's not very extendable. You can always add new cores, but it's a bit harder if you if you need to add something completely different, or if you need extra simulator or something like that. So, my mother always told me that I should use clean socks. So uh, I'm basically taking a fresh look at this. So, the core of everything. We have a system uh, which consists of cores like UART, or 1200, memory controllers. We have a top level that binds it all together, and we have some glue logic uh, that is system specific. These things can end up in a simulator model together with a test bench and test cases, or we can build up for an FPGA with constrained files and other target specific uh, things. And if we look at the core, we see that they are basically packages of files that should be compiled or synthesized. Um, we find them either on our hard drive or online somewhere. Uh, the course can include drivers and uh, other stuff that we put into them. And they can depend on each other. Like this made up example of a data logger in hardware, which uses a UDP stack that we get from GitHub, which in turn uses an Ethernet Mac that you can get from open cores. And it consists of a GMII interface and a FIFO. 
So this does sound like a problem that is being solved somewhere else. So I <laughs> want to look at it like this. Hmm. This is a source-based distribu distribution we're using. Uh, can we get, can we copy some IDs that are already in place so we don't have to reinvent everything? Like depend dependency handling and things like that. Well, this is Orptalk version 3. Um, I have focused on making it modular so we can replace parts very easily. Uh, I don't want to make changes to the original course too much uh, because then I think if we force a structure on, on a core then it's less likely that people who maintain these cores will adapt to this structure. We could perhaps add some kind of file in the root, but uh, that's basically all we can do. I want a clean separation of source and generated files. This is more a management issue, but you should be able to move your uh, all the generated files uh, somewhere else very easy uh, if you want to rebuild something or if you want to have a snapshot of uh, everything. I want it to be easy to extend both new tools, uh, new cores, new simulators, new vendor specific stuff. I want it to be, it's to be easy to use so we can have a lot more people contributing and using it. And I want to reuse existing technology because uh, every time you write new code you probably introduce bugs so if I can use something that's already available that's much better. When doing hardware design, it's not always as nice as doing software design. We have some severe limitations on the hardware side. Uh, Altera, Xilinx, Lattice, Actel, they all use their separate tool chains, uh, back-end tools, and ways to get things done. We have no standardized build system, so you can't make a, do a make disk check and then distribute to core as it is today. Uh, and you, you can't rely on these things, which makes the core logic in Orpsock a bit more complicated. We have to handle both simulation and hardware, which are fundamentally different targets uh, in many ways, even though it sh the simulation should be a representation of the hardware. Especially, you can't use vendor-specific models like hard uh, memory controllers and things like that in our open source simulators, which it's a big limitation for so many reasons. And Verilog and VHDL, which are the currently most supported languages, are not very good. Um, things that should be easy to do are hard to do. And System Verilog is not that well supported yet, so we don't want to introduce that in code for synthesis. When you say no standardized build systems, mm. you mean we don't have them, not that there's any reason why you couldn't have them. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it took, I guess it's taken many years to have a standard set up with make, install, configure, and things like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we're not there uh, on the hardware side. There are some, oh, I would rather say there are many people who try to solve this problem, but no one is looking at what the other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So I try to stay away a bit from all of that right now. So we take a look at the structure that is in Orpsoc version 3 right now. Um, in the root, we have an optional config file, uh, mainly used for set up some paths and uh, default tools. You could run without it. You have a build directory where all your, all your things end up, and most of this is configurable, so you can just choose another name for it or another directory if you want to. We have a cache for uh, things that are downloaded. I will come back to that later on. Uh, we have a systems directory that contains descriptions of the systems themselves. Cores contains descriptions for the cores. Uh, a binary and then a P Python library, uh, which basically is Orpsox. So I switched from using a makefile based implementation to a Python thing. And also I made sure that these are system wide installable, so you should be able to apt get your Orpsox and then supply your own. Uh, build, build uh, directories and uh, cache directories and the rest should be available on the system. 
If we take a deeper look in the core directory, we have two examples here. We have a JTAG tap core, uh, which only consists of patches. Uh, this is because when we want to use the core, it will be downloaded from Subversion, or if it's already available, it will be fetched from the cage. A local core, on the other hand, is, core, is a core that has all its code in the ORPSOC tree. Both have core descriptions, but these also have its very log and, in this case, C files in the core directory. A system consists of a description file, which is quite similar to the core description file. Uh, a lot of very log files, or VHDL for that reason. Uh, some test bench components, perhaps, and different files that you might need. And this structure is, you can use any structure you want. Uh, it's up to the whoever designs the system. Uh, I don't want to set any policies for this yet. Can we take a look at how it works with a simple example? We want to run the test case over 1200 basic on the generic reference system. Generic is the only supported system right now. It, uh, it's a technology independent uh, system and chip. Um, so we run the ORPSOC binary with a SIM operation. Uh, it only, currently only handles a SIM and list cores and list systems. I'm working on a build target too. We specify the system, generic in this case, but it could be or DB2A or Atlas or Nexus or D Nano or whatever. Specify a test case and an optional timeout. Um, this should be two dashes there too. So. Hmm. And what happens then? First of all, the system description is located and parsed. So we had a, we have a systems di directory where we look for these system description files. And they look like this. Uh, we have some generic options like name and descriptions. We provide all the RTL files that are to be used. There's a difference between the RTL files and the include files because the RTL files will be uh, added to the scripts uh, for which uh, files to compile. This will only be copied and uh, included with an include directory. Uh, I'll come back to that later too. Some test bench files, these are only used in simulation, not for uh, FPGA targets. We tell what simulators we support, can't only Icarus is supported, but we should be able to use Verilator or Model Sim or whatever we want. And we tell uh, which cores that should be included in the system. This should be called depend or something, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, we use the cloud interface, uh, which is a made up interface for talking to a cloud. Use the debug, the over 1200, and some wishbone utilities. Uh, presumably, with simulators, you also then want to go on and allow the option not just of simulators that work on the Verilog, but potentially for cores that come with simulation models, perhaps in system C. Mm -hmm. So it, it wants to presumably won't be able to do that eventually. Yes, this will be, that part uh, is somewhat solved by looking at the core description, uh, which also has a name and description, <coughs> and which RTL files to use, and include files, and test bench files. It has a provider uh, section, which basically tells where to get this IP. And uh, open course is currently the only uh, supported, but I will soon add some GitHub and uh, things like that uh, when we have cores that need to be fetched from there. Hey, oh, uh, sorry, just a quick question. What, what format are these files? Uh, these are uh, INI files. INI files. Uh, so they are automatically parsed with the Python's uh, config parser. Oh, okay, cool. So it's like some native format that's supported by Python. like. Yeah, it's, like <coughs> it's uh, used by Windows and used by System D and uh, in some form. Sections. I wanted to use something that was less complicated than XML, but uh, already available, so I don't need to invent a new format for this too. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's good. And here we have a VPI section. Uh, if there are additional sections, they will be 
parsed if they are handled. Only BPI is handled right now, where we uh, have our source files and include files. Uh, and this is probably where uh, system C models will go, or let's say uh, proprietary <coughs> netlists or things like that. The structure is not fully complete yet. So we get all the cores. Uh, first we look if they are available in the, in the cage. If they are, we export them to the build directory, uh, or the source directory inside the build directory. Uh, and we apply patches, local patches, which means that if the upstream core is something, has some bug or some problem, we patch it locally before we use it. Uh, if it's not available locally, we use the provider fetch command to um, download it forehand. And this also means that for every, every core ends up in this tree, so if you just want to stop after this operation, you have the whole warp stock, all the source code for the, uh, for the system and chip available in your build source directory and you can export it to your own build system if you don't want to use warp stock after this. I mean many uh, companies want to use their own structures, so you just need to use warp stock to generate the first copy. Um, after that we write the config files for the simulator, we compile VPI li libraries if they are available, and we compile the finished com uh, simulator binary. And since we applied dash dash test case, this also triggers a simulator.run command, uh, which makes the simulator run. We then pass us all the VTI files as arguments, and the additional uh, arguments are passed as plus args in Verilog, which means that we can use this binary uh, standalone and just apply the test cases as plus args. Currently, it only handles VMAN files, but I'm planning to use, reuse the uh, uh, ELF loader for somewhere so I can. Uh, use ELF files directly, or binary files for that reason. And we uh, output things to standard output and a log file. This is very much how uh, Orpsoc version 2 looks like, but the name of the test case is hard-coded in the model. Right now, we only have one system, the generic system, which also means that since it has no target hardware, we can only simulate it. It supports Icarus with VPI. Uh, it passes the OR1200 and UART tests from Orpsoc version 2. Uh, these are the only peripheral peripherals that are included right now. Uh, we can use uh, the GDB server part, so we can uh, upload test cases over RSP if we want to do that. Uh, there are some local cores called RAM uh, Wishbone, which is from stolen from the Orpsoc version 2. Uh, a new one called Wishbone Utils, which contains a new uh, bus infrastructure uh, with multiplexers and arbiters for the Wishbone bus. Yeah, it says at the bottom here. Oh, sorry. So, uh, a lot of things are in place, but there's much more to do. <laughs> so the first thing I want to do is have, make it have feature parity with Orbs of version 2, mostly. I'll probably drop a few things that aren't strictly needed. Uh, I got the ORDB2A and an Atlas board, so those are the first targets I will um, port it to. I want, I'm want. i working on support for very later right now. Model sim will probably come later. And then the fun begins. Uh, now when we have a Python library, we can do a lot of cool things. We can use, we can add a user interface on top of this if we want to, and just call functions. Uh, and I hope to reuse some of the, improve the dependency handling from uh, uh, Gentoo, or at least use it as an inspiration for more fine-grained dependency handling. 
Uh, I've been thinking about integrating with WAF, which is a uh, Python build system. They, that would mean I don't have to uh, implement a lot of the basic code for uh, building things. But it might be too complicated to use, on the other hand, it's a trade-off. I want to make it even more modular, uh, like memories and FIFOs, if you only have one implementation of those things for each uh, FPGA target then you have less code to maintain and less bugs to fix. Uh, and I will, I'm starting to look at IPXact compatibility, because IPXact is a standard for a lot of things, for bus connections, for how the how cores should be set up. And it hasn't really taken off yet, because it's quite a complicated system. We should probably take a closer look at uh, Cactus 2, I believe it's called. Yeah, Cactus 2 is an uh, open source tool for uh, doing things with cores that are IPX exact compatible. And I hope it would be easy to integrate when, it, when that time comes. And I just added these things at the bottom. Uh, I was really impressed by the ECOS uh, settings files. I want to be able to either load these settings files from ECOS and generate base addresses for peripherals and things like that, or export an ORPSOC configuration to uh, ECOS compatible format. Uh, the less configuration files we have, the better, since we don't have mismatches between them. And also, the same thing applies to device tree files. Uh, I'm not sure if there already are any things for that in place. So, uh, I don't have any demonstration, it would just be a matter of running orpsoc sim generic uh, dash dash test case <laughs> equals something. So, uh, it would return, it would say return zero, so it's not that fun to look at. <laughs> so, um, questions? Uh, oh look, you, you answered one of my questions just at the end there, which is, I was going to say, you're picking up a project that to me looks huge. I'm just thinking how many years it's taken the auto tools guys, and they still haven't got it right. Mm. Um, but it's great that you're going to look at WAF, and I'd strongly encourage you to go down that route yeah. or one of the other things. So you can reuse, and there's a second benefit of that, which is if you put something in front of people that's based on something they already yeah. know, they're much more likely to adopt it. The second thing is to, I wonder how, what other sources of effort in this space there are you can draw on. And I know just from my connections in Bristol that some of the, a group of Bristol companies, one of which was Broadcom and one of which was TBS, were getting together to do, try and solve this sort of problem, more from a hardware perspective, they were in the verification space. And I know they started considering putting together an open source consortium to do it. Um, and I wonder whether there's mileage here almost in talking to companies like those so that instead of you doing it along with all your other commercial objectives, you might actually get some investment from the wider electronics community to really turn this into a, a project. And it would be great to have open cores actually leading the way mm. on a technology in this field, rather than as we tend to do, which has been an open source re-implementation of existing technology. Yeah, and you're putting in, just saying something which is the main problem here. It's not that it's this, these things are currently unavailable is that everyone is doing their own implementation of this problem. So, from my point of view, I <coughs> wanted to do something that solves what Orpsoc version 2 fails at, at the moment, which is to uh, get the cores from the correct places. But I would really like to see that some dominant system comes out and just uh, wins <laughs> this. and. Um, I'll talk to you later about that. It's yeah, I mean, I'd encourage I just, having heard the same story, not, uh, you're talking about a solution, I've heard the story of the problem from other people yeah. in the industry. And the EDA companies hate this sort of work because it's stealing from them. But the electronics companies love it because they're fed up with paying the EDA companies. So I think you might get some sympathy from some of the big electronics corporations to, to backing what you're doing in a more general way. Yeah. What, what EDA companies provide solutions like this though? Silings, well, Silings Platform Studio, uh, Altera. Yeah, but it's all GUI based stuff. <laughs> you still have to overlay your. You still have to overlay <laughs> make <laughs> files. Mm. You, know, you have to go and. 
Sorry? Yeah. Give the men some gear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants you, no one who does real work uses GUIs, right? You fuck around with it first go, but then you script it because you got other things to do with your day. Yeah, so, I actually have been uh, stuck in that uh, Silence Platform Studio for a, a few weeks now, and I want just to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, I don't think EDA do support this sort of thing. I mean, uh, well, well, no, part of my job at the moment is implementing this sort of thing yeah. inside the company. Yeah, the EDA doesn't support it, but it likes to pretend it does and sell yeah. tools. But you know, it sells you graphical tools that are impressive to the CAD manager. No, yeah, sure. But then a real engineer looks at it and says, "Stop wasting my time." Then so, the project manager says, "Why don't you use this fancy gear yeah. thing? That must be faster." Yeah, <laughs> and then you, I don't know. Yeah. But you, you, boss. you know, I mean, this is a great example of where you could actually potentially take it forward and have or open cores actually leading the way, mm -hmm. and where it's not open source is a, a new re-implementation, but where it's actually the only implementation. Yeah, we have uh, quite many uh, IP cores that could be standardized or could be used as a, as a larger library mm -hmm. that could be easy to uh, implement the projects. Right mm -hmm. now it's very uh, low level. Broadcom and open source. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a measure of how, how difficult they thought this problem was, that they were seriously talking, of, uh, and in public, I mean, this was done through the NMI, the trade body in the UK, okay. about setting up an open source. If they're talking in public, that says they're really Panicking, worried. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, people like TVS, who you won't know, um, you know, they're, per they're, they're more easy to deal with on that. I can't remember who the third co company was. It was another, another one of the big chip companies in Britain. Yes, thank you. Uh, sorry, can you go back to the last slide? Okay. This one. This was uh, the, <laughs> the previous slide, I mean. Uh, mm. <coughs> yeah, this looks really good, I think. I hadn't really kept up with what you're doing, and I'm very impressed. If, yeah, like, what the fact I want that you're to using Python ultimately, I think, is a big improvement over the make stuff. Yeah. And what I really want is, uh, when uh, more things are put in place, is to people to contribute and uh, porting their also version 2 ports to this new format. And hopefully it will be quite easy. Cool. Yes, yeah. more questions? I have one more hmm? question. Um, maybe, I don't know, it's really a question, but um, they, got, they have got this taste tool chain uh, developed at ESA. And it's used to build a <coughs> larger system from a set of blocks. Mm -hmm. And it goes down to RTL as well, and up to network stacks and standards to exchange telemetry packets and everything. So I was wondering, maybe it would be nice to see, because this tool is open source. It's fully open source, and they have been working for a couple of years on it. So maybe it would be nice to look at it, because it also does some gluing between modules, and maybe be a little bit compatible with that. Maybe it would benefit somehow. I don't know. Yeah, that good. sounds like a really good thing. Uh, that's what I want. I want first compatibility with all the existing tools out there, because I don't I really like the want gentle to make idea. I am a gentle user. Yeah, hard to really loves the idea. And let's say that. Of course, from the Linux, let's say, user perspective, it's not always convenient to, to, to actually recompile everything. It takes ages. But from the, let's say, VHDL perspective, when you actually are writing modules, etc., you actually want to recompile that test stuff, etc. So we've used also version 2, and all the issues that you've mentioned, we've, it was really a problem, let's say. Of course, not an unsolvable problem, but a problem that this is is important. You don't always want to deal with that, let's say, by on, uh, let's say writing some additional stuff, etc. It would be great to get such a solution. But I agree with Jeremy that it's a big issue to actually not even write the tool, but to maintain that. Mm. Like, for example, there is a gentle version for FreeBSD, mm. uh, which is kind of the same thing, but with a FreeBSD kernel. But because it's less popular than gentle, it tends to not work because you download something and the compilation, of course, crashes. 
the good thing is that most many of these cores that we use are haven't been updated for five years, so uh, they're not very fast moving. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe it will help, but I think that it's a really bigger problem with maintaining such a system of patches, etc. Yeah. So a community problem. Yeah, yeah I think the tools is the start to actually building such community because now it's impossible because there's no way of actually, let's say, issuing such patches even because you're making an easy way to maintain things like yeah. one person can this, the other, something else. And that's why I don't want to waste too much, much time writing these things either, because I don't think this is b the final solution. I think something better will come along, but in the meantime, this is uh, uh, something better than WebSocket version 2, I hope, or will be. From the sound of it. Yeah, you haven't tried it yet. Thank you.